is an endless sea of podcast about entrepreneurship. Talk, talk, talking about it, but not living it. We live it every day. This is Inside the Wolf's Den, an entrepreneurial journey with Sean and Joni Wolfswinkle, talking about real estate investing, but also encompassing general subjects in regards to owning small to medium-sized businesses, and of course, all the struggles that business owners must overcome to be successful. This is Inside the Wolf's Den, and this is Sean and Joni Wolfswinkle. Welcome back to Inside the Wolf's Den with your host, Sean and Joni Wolfswinkle. How are you doing? Good. It's been a busy week, so, but uh, yeah, looking forward to the weekend and warm weather and maybe the pool. Yeah, and you just turned 40, so (laughs) happy birthday. (laughs) Thank you. So today we have a special guest as well as our good friend and real estate entrepreneur, Jim Zaspel. Hey, Jim, how are you doing? Hey, Johnny. Great to be here. Thank you both for having me. And and, uh, and again, happy birthday, Sean. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to this. I think you got a lot to offer and uh, add a ton of value. And I, I know you got great stories and you're a good storyteller. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Really cool story. Yeah. So yeah. just a little brief bio on Jim. So Jim Zaspel's journey to a thriving real estate career was not a conventional one. He began began as a frustrated landscaper who had grown tired of all the challenges that came with the industry. As an entrepreneur at his heart since preteen days, Jim knew there was a better creative outlet for him and a better way he could help others. His interests in real estate were first realized when his first deal, a house in Norristown, Pennsylvania, where he cleared $13,800. Since then, Jim has made a huge career leaps in a short amount of time. Despite early setbacks in real estate after starting over in 2014, Jim's company wholesales, fix and flips, buys and rents about 150 to 200 houses per year. That's pretty amazing, Jim. Um, In in addition to his own success, Jim has always working to share his expertise and bolster the success of other newcomers to real estate investing. He has taught countless workshops and seminars, co-written a best-selling book, been featured on many podcasts as an expert interview, and delivered keynote speeches at The Collective Genius the nation's most elite real estate mastermind, and much more. But for Jim, business is simply a means to fuel and his and fill his lifestyle vision. As a father of three children and a devoted husband, family time is extremely important to him. Thanks to his team, his systems, and re- refusal to let work get in the way of life, he gets all his work done after having breakfast with his family every morning and before he gets home from dinner. So, again, thanks so much, Jim, for being here today with us. Um, Love to hear your story, um, and so if you want to give us a little bit of background on yourself, and uh, I'll let you go from there. Awesome. Well, again, super excited to be here. Um, you know, so a lot of people I've noticed, like especially Collective Genius, where we met, have these you know, maybe uh, glamorous or exciting careers before this, and, and not me. I've, I've done two things for money in my life. I, I started mowing neighbors' lawns when I was 12 years old, and I grew in a little landscaping business and kept doing that until uh, until I failed at it when the economy kind of fell apart in in, uh, in 07, 08. And uh, I read, my dad, had, a few years prior, had bought me a book um, by uh, by Guru, who's actually now a member of CG, a collective genius. And as when I was 18, he bought this book. When I'm 21, almost 22, I finally read that book. That was by Ron Grand. And I got to read this book, and it was, uh, you know, all you need to know about buying and selling houses, you know, get this free book to pay shipping and handling, right? At the back end of the book, there was uh, this offer, uh, you know, get these CD set for like 45 bucks. I bought the CD set and I called the phone number. They said, hey, make sure you listen to the CD set um, at least once the next seven days after you get it. I'm going to call you. We're going to brainstorm. This telemarketer is telling me this. Uh, I'm going to brainstorm with you, Jim, on, on how to take your start your real estate investing business. He said, awesome. Thank you so much. It to- setting me up so much. I was so nice. <laughs> I had no idea, right? So I listened to the CD set three times, not once, three times. And I was so excited for this phone call. And he got through the pitch, and then he said, hey, Ron asked me to invite you. I thought it was a personal invitation. <laughs> Ron asked – I kid you not. Ron asked me to invite you to this upcoming boot camp in Chicago for five days. We're going to learn all this stuff. I said, great. Tell him I said I really appreciate it. I said, just so you know, I've got a negative net worth by about three times right now, so I've got like seven free liquid. <laughs> I've got uh, um, I've got about uh, nineteen thousand dollars in credit card debt, but I'll find a way to be there. 
He said, awesome. How do you want to pay the $5,000 registration fee? Visa or Amex? I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, pay, I took the money out of my Roth IRA. I started when I was like 14 or 13, and wow. I paid that 5000 bucks. Wow. And I think that's an example of sometimes we've got to help people make the hard decisions that are best for them in life, right? I, I, I'm just curious. What was that like uh, meeting him? Like, I don't know if you had met him before, but in the mastermind and then oh. like going back <laughs> You know, to like, hey, I'm sitting in the same room, you know, we're in, I don't know, the same life, the same level, but, you know, sitting there meeting the guy that started you off. That's kind of cool, right? It, yeah. it is really cool. Yeah. It was, uh, it's, it's really fun. You know, two totally different levels, like but except, but, uh, but yeah, it was, it was kind of exciting, right? You know, it's when how life happens. So yeah. anyway, that was the end of 2008, did my first deal in March of 09, and that was uh, a bunch of hundreds of houses ago, and that's this, uh, Grew up in a little lower middle class family, college dropout, homeschooled all twelve years, and um, pretty pretty simple. Just to, that's and, it. And your dad's yes. a, a pastor, right? Or was? Yes, is he it? is. Oh, yeah, okay. still is. Yeah. Still is. I'm a part time professor at uh, Southern Baptist uh, Theological Seminary as well, and awesome. he's written a bunch of books and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool. pretty cool. So I, I remember there was a good story you used to tell about. Uh, I don't know if it was when you had to start over, but I remember there was a good story you got on the news and then you, uh, <laughs> and not in a good Take, way. Taking it back. I don't, I don't know if that's a good story, but it's a story. <laughs> it's a story that has probably scarred you. <laughs> so uh, within about two and a half years of getting started in real estate, I had uh, bought or uh, controlled through like a lease option, uh, 46 units, 29 buildings. And I, on, on paper, I think I was making like 15 grand a month uh, cash flow. Wow. And that happened, I think, one month. And then, uh, you know, I was just the world's, I was 24 years old this time, maybe 25, 24, I think. And uh, just the world's worst landlord. Um, yeah, tenants would say, hey, I can't pay rent this month. I said, don't worry about it. And I believed every sob story I was told. <laughs> and uh, um, anyway, I said, by the way, just pay me next month and forget about the late fee. I know it's a difficult time for you. Just like, I was just as dumb as they, as they get. <laughs> And uh, so before I know it, uh, eight out of 46 people are paying, units are, are performing a month. And wow. uh, that's just not a good ratio. Yeah. I don't know what you guys are, your numbers are in your property management business, but I hope it's better than eight out of 46. <laughs> oh, yeah, a lot better. I'd be, uh, we probably wouldn't be on this call if it was that bad. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> lots so, of cash for keys. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, lots of cash for keys. So anyway, uh, just like everything started crumbling. And it's, it's not the tenant's fault. It's not the contractor's fault. It was my fault. I just didn't manage the business well. And, uh, you know, I, I discovered, at least for me, when I was desperate, I did a lot of desperate things, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did a couple of deals that weren't right. Uh, you know, it's a couple of subject two deals. Nothing wrong with subject two, but I didn't do it the right way. And lost the one or two houses to foreclosure that I'd sold on a lease option and mm -hmm. people lost their deposits. I made it all right, but it was, it was rough, like October of 2012. So there it was that the girl I thought I wanted to marry dumped my ass because I, so <laughs> I was on the 11 o'clock news, kicked out of all the RIA meetings. I was depressed. Like I was like the only time in my life I've been depressed and uh, living at my parents' house and $300,000 in debt. And like all my employees, including VAs, quit. Wow. Right. It was just a, a rough time. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I appreciate you sharing that because I, I, the big thing with, with this podcast and what we try to do is like, educate people. We have a lot of people that are new to real estate investing or just uh, being an entrepreneur. And, you know, like, especially with social media these days, you, you see all the, every, all the great scenes, you know, and all the, and, and supposedly everything's going well, but like, you, you don't know, see the, the struggles or failures. Yeah. yeah so I, Absolutely. I'm sure you learned a ton from that, <laughs> that whole, yeah. yeah. And rebuilt. And, and luckily you had the, uh, the, the, share with me, like, how did you come out of that though? mentally and and then maybe even business wise yeah it's um it's hard because like uh, um i don't know like it's hard to see your way out sometimes mm -hmm. and i was listening to a friend of mine talk because sometimes when you're, when you're in those those down times you've got to uh, just trust that you can get out and just take the next step you don't know you need to see every step take the next step but i remember it was I think january of 2013 uh yes i just got finished setting uh, new year's goals and whatnot and um, I thought, you know, I, 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 for full disclosure, like I was dodging everybody's phone calls, uh, you know, ignoring emails. Like it was just, I was not responding to anybody. It's being totally immature. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm better than this. I was raised better than this. I know better. And so in one day, I called every single person I had money to. Mm. And um, said, listen, I got, I got good news. I got bad news. 
Uh, the good news is I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to pay you something every single month until you're paid back. Um, the bad news is I don't know how I can pay you more than 10 bucks a month. And some months will be 10 bucks. And by the way, some months it was $10. If I paid, starting then I paid somebody or everybody something every single month. Wow. Um, so I think it starts with like facing your fears. I mean, if you got like crap you got to deal with, deal with it. Mm -hmm. And you know, they didn't all like the answer. They didn't appreciate it. They were like, oh, thank you so much. No, I got no thank yous. <laughs> like, okay, we'll see how you do. Right. And I, I was actually expecting thank you for calling me as I didn't get any of those. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so that was like the first step. And then uh, I'll tell you the second step. Um, so I, I told you I got kicked out of all the RIA meetings. I used to go to all of them. And I decided if I can't join them, I'll beat them. And so I wanted to start my own re meeting with, with two goals. One was to out earn the reputation I, I had earned myself. Mm -hmm. And then the second goal was to have the biggest monthly group of real estate investors in Philadelphia, which I wound up accomplishing uh, with Marina. But here's the funny part, and then I'll, I'll move on uh, to answer your question. Uh, in February, in February 20th, 2013, I was having my first re meeting. It was, a, it was in the back room of a Panera Bread, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, 27 people were, re were registered on meetup.com to show up. And uh, the day of my first meeting, I remember, not as depressed, a little depressed, still dead broke, still single, and still wishing I wasn't. Like, it was just, no, Jimmy was not happy. <laughs> and um, the day of that first meeting, there were a couple other, you know, people who had investor groups and big wholesalers and realtors. About six or seven people sent an email out to their whole list saying, you know, Jim's a real well, fill in the blank. And by the way, I think twice about going to his meeting tonight. Here's the link to the six ABC news uh, interview. Wow. And like, I just like the phone call started coming in and like, I'm just, I started crying cry for like 10 minutes and wow. I just feel sorry for myself. Um, and I, I almost called off the meeting because I was afraid to face, you know, the fear of like, you know, public rejection. I don't know. Yeah. And I did. Uh, so I decided to do it. I, I sent another email to Melissa. Hey, we're on. I'll, I'll address your concerns tonight. We're on. So I did the meeting and uh, you know who showed up for that meeting? Marina, that's where we met. Wow. My wife, yeah. And um, she was kind of curious all this uh, drama. She wanted to <laughs> <put> on. <laughs> she's like, hey, I can fix this, I can fix this. She's a, <laughs> she's a keeper because no, she, she, really, she, got, yeah. she met you at your lowest. So, and then, yeah, that's an awesome story. Yeah. I didn't know all that. Or maybe yeah. you told me and I don't remember or, uh, so just so you know, uh, Jim, um, we've had some great dinners together. So I, I think your first Collective Genius meeting we met and had dinner yeah. with you. But uh, uh, the we've had some good, we've had a lot of wine. And I remember uh, <laughs> that one time when we were like, yeah, we're going to do a uh, triathlon. Uh, yeah, uh, you guys Iron committed Man. to it. <laughs> Iron Man, half Iron Man. I, th I think it was a half. Maybe it was a full. It but was a half. Yeah, but uh, and thank God it got uh, wiped out in COVID, so uh, eliminated. So I didn't have to do it. I was training every day. So COVID, I'm like, screw this, let's drink. And we we were holding each other accountable for a little while, but then it kind of. Well, I know these two here. I mean, once you commit to something, that's it. It's going down. So no, what does your business look like today? Like, what do you, you know, because I I think that's a great, you know, people need to hear that, like that. It, it it's I mean Joni I've had them ups and downs and it's like a roller coaster sometimes and I think you know you you built something really great and you had a lot of cash flow and then it totally tanked and went the other way and you hit rock bottom but then you have a really cool business today so yeah. tell us about it like what what do you what does it look like today employees number of houses what do you do sure so we're about uh, fifteen percent fix and flip fifteen percent you know buying rentals maybe fifteen and twenty. And then uh, the balance is wholesale. So last year we did 154 deals. It's amazing. Uh, fixed and flip 30, uh, bought 28 rentals, and then wholesale the rest. And this year we're trending and tracking right about similar numbers. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit less uh, fixed and flips, more wholesales uh, than that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we're you know, 12 or so a month, give or take. And uh, I think we're selling four tomorrow, which is exciting. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So it's, that's cool. what we do. We've got 60 something rentals. Uh, not like you guys, but uh, it's, those are all bought in the last three years. That's um, awesome. Well, I know that Marina was riding alongside you, you know, building this business and, you know, with the kids, I know there's a million things going on for her. So she's still, you know, riding alongside you and, and building the business with you? No. And uh, it actually like really, so we, so we, when I started over, like she started and like we kind of grew it together. Uh -huh. It was great. And in 2018, 
uh, she you know, really started stepping out of the business to, to be with the kids. Right. Which was the decision we, we went through together and, and uh, you know, I supported fully. Um, I didn't realize how much I needed her in the business. Mm-hmm. Right. And so 2018, 2019 did a ton of deals, like 180 something houses in 2019. I made no money. I mean, I made no money in 2019. Wow. Um, you know, it's like 186 houses and made no money. This is, this is not cool. It's not, not supposed to work this way. I don't <laughs> this You're taking cool. all the risk. Why am I not making money? Yeah. And yeah, I was just, I was being a sloppy, you know, visionary business owner who didn't really take care of his stuff real well. Um, you know, so I started, got a lot more disciplined in 2020 mm-hmm. and, uh, made my, so, so she's, so she works three quarters of one day a week and, um, very valuable three quarters of one day, but she does, uh, she keeps a tight brand of the finances, which I very much appreciate. And, um, she asks really insightful questions and tells me what to do. It's awesome. Yeah. That's sweet. Very so, cool. So tell me, how are you, um, what's your like best lead source and like, how are you, you know, cause I think a challenge that a lot of investors are facing right now is like the market's so hot, it's hard to find deals, but you're still doing a hundred and what'd you say? 180 or you know, 200. Deal, mm-hmm. 200 deals. Like how are you finding deals still? Is it, you know, how do you overcome that, that challenge? Sure. Um, I actually did a Facebook live video. This is like, so your marketing uh, campaign doesn't work. You know, check these seven boxes before you you know throw in the towel in the marketing campaign, right? And really, um, what a market like this does is it makes us all get better and more right. more efficient, right? So you just in, just real quick, what are the steps of a marketing campaign? Uh, if you're doing direct mail, you've got to you know you're you know viewing your data, you got to make sure you're tracking everything. You know, monitor and measure your you know your answering rates, your live answer rates, how many abandoned calls. Audit your phone calls with your lead managers. Um, you know how far out are you booking appointments when the call comes in? And when a home buying specialist mm-hmm. meets the seller, are you auditing those seller meetings? What are those numbers like? How trained are they? How are they staying on top of the game? If you're wholesaling, what's your dispo process like? So there's so many steps in a deal from start to finish. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we say a marketing campaign doesn't work, but really the market just got a little tighter, and that marketing channel still works. We're just sloppy op- mm-hmm. sloppy operators. And so that's like my, my first comment. My lead sources, um, so we spend just under 40 grand a month in marketing. It used to be more, but it's like 40 right now. Uh, about 25 of that is on TV, mm-hmm. and the balance is on direct mail. That's it. We, uh, um, we stopped doing uh, texting. We never were, we weren't that big in it anyway. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, I probably should turn back on my PPC, at least by retargeting. I, uh, I don't know, for political reasons that I'm not giving these organizations my money. <laughs> 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 But uh, we will go there, and, and this, now it's just TV and direct mail. Yeah. Wow. Are you, are you the uh, face of the TV ads? I'm not. You're not. I'm not. But I'm going to reach, like, they, the, the effectiveness has, has waned a bit. So uh, I emailed them recently. Let's, we need to shoot some more ads. I think uh-huh. it's, uh, I, w- I want to try doing something different. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I wonder if the female, you know, version works versus the male, or, or you know, since you're such a star on TV in your market. <laughs> <laughs> you may be getting you back on there. So, yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah. But uh, and what does it take to run a business like that? Well, how many staff, um, you know, and what, what does your average day look like? So uh, how many staff? It's uh, about 10. I actually hired my COO. Uh, he starts on Monday. So. Oh, awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, super excited. Uh, it's, a, it's a big step, um, but uh, very excited about the individual and mm-hmm. about the prospects of it. So we've got uh, – uh, three acquisitions managers, and what these guys do is, uh, yeah, they, they go meet with the sellers and negotiate a deal and get contracts signed. Then uh, we've got uh, two right now, will be three uh, lead managers. Now uh, we have uh, one and a half transaction coordinators, uh, full time dispo uh, dispositions, uh, project manager, and then um, some other part time uh, virtual staff mm-hmm. as well. And what's your day look like? Typical, what, what do you do day to day? Yeah, so my days uh, Other than start with posts on Facebook with, all the time. Yeah. So. Besides, besides posts on Facebook all the time. Yeah. Don't worry, Jimmy tells me that all the time too. <laughs> Going live on Facebook, usually in your car, I think, right? Always, almost always in my car. Yeah. yeah. It's like, what else am I going to do? <laughs> Might as well make it productive, right? That's right. I remember uh, Mike Jake uh, posted like this thing like a year ago on Facebook. Uh, Mike Jake's friend from CG. Yeah. He says, uh, he's like, what's with all these people doing Facebook videos while they're driving? It's terrible. It's not safe. But, you know, he's always doing videos of himself <laughs> driving 200 miles an hour. <laughs> and, but just so we're clear, it's safe at 200 miles an hour, right? Right. Yeah. And, I mean, his eyes are at least on the road, you know, not on the camera and video. 
Yeah. So that, that's what he pointed out. I'm like, dude, I tried not to say it, but I just couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, but anyway, besides Facebook, um, I start off with uh, two daily huddles. Um, uh, well, from like eight o'clock, like I, I do um, BS with the emails and stuff like that. Then at 8.45, I have an acquisition huddle that goes till nine, maybe 9.10. Mm-hmm. Then at 9.15, and then over, and then on those acquisition huddles, this is not deal analysis time. It's just uh, how many how many appointments yesterday, and what was the outcome of each. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's one appointment you can push over the edge for today, mm-hmm. and what's your commitment for action items that you can control today. So it's like a five point bullet for each person, and then uh, the similar outline for the uh, disposition huddle at uh, nine fifteen, um, and then I go on Facebook and just you know click around and see what's up. Yeah. Uh, but now that it's, I'm always just keeping an eye on deals. I don't beyond that. I have no routines. Um, I try to do one or two lunches a week uh, with uh, maybe it's a vendor, maybe it's a, another investor local. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, that's awesome. I mean, that, that's key. Did you find? Do you find that? Because I think we only meet like once a week for you know certain departments, and I, I think that's probably genius, especially with the sales. To and it's not you're you're not going like probably real deep, but you probably cr- course correct a lot of things real quickly. Mm-hmm. Is that? Yeah. Uh, well, what I found is it keeps uh, everybody accountable. So they've got to have their after action notes in our CRM mm-hmm. after the sales meeting. And if they show up the next morning huddle and their previous day's notes aren't on there. It's like, dude, where are your notes from yesterday's been two meetings mm-hmm. or three meetings. Um, so there's this accountability that comes up. And also, you know, who likes to show up to a daily huddle and say, I got zero contracts yesterday and everybody else got, each got one or two. Yeah. Um, so that accountability on a few different levels is very helpful. I love that. We do huddles in our entire organization, but um, not just departments. So I, I think, um, yeah, I love that idea. Are you able to, uh, how, how do you overcome, um, see, I'm asking you a lot of questions for me personally, but I, hopefully <laughs> people will benefit from it. So how do you, are you, I've always struggled with like, I, I got it all in my mind, like how to analyze a deal or like, so how do you decide between a wholesale, if you're going to keep it as a flip or a rental, you know, how are you distinguishing that with your acquisition reps? Or is that something that you're going through? So you're, you're talking about their leads, what they, you know, and, and going through them. How, how do you decipher which, which bucket they go into? Sure. Um, so as with most of my answers, I've got a story. Uh, that's perfect so so back in january this year i think part of the reason i was getting a little burnt out at that time was uh um, i was confident we were booking 60 70 some weeks 90 appointments a week it's crazy right now just ridiculous um and uh it was some of those appointments should should not have been booked but uh, but we were and i was i was the one pulling comps and all those leads this is stupid And um, so rather than having each acquisition is comp their own appointments, because I want to get their head out of the, uh, the math, out of the analytical stuff, and mm-hmm. focus more on the sales psychology mm-hmm. of the transaction. So I have them pulling comps on each other's appointments. Um, so they give each other, hey, here's a low anchor price. Here's where I think it's going to go. Looks like a straight wholesale deal, right? So that's in terms of like pre-appointment, they do each other's research, not, not their own. Mm-hmm. It just keeps their... Um, the focus on the salesmanship of the conversation versus the analytical side. I learned that from uh, Eric Brewer and so far it's working yeah. well. Uh, in terms of what do I wholesale, what do I fix and flip? Um, I hate doing construction in the, in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, it's just a pain in the butt yeah. for a lot of reasons. Uh, so if it's in Philly, like f- with virtually no exceptions, I'm not buying it. So it's a wholesale. Mm. Uh, so that's easy. Um, if it's in the suburbs and it's a desirable area that I'm, virtually with no exceptions going to buy it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so it's, if, they, if they're not, usually it's pretty clear, but like 20% of the time it's not. And so they might, you know, get my opinion on that one specific deal. And uh, you know, sometimes I decide before the contract, sometimes after, uh, you know, maybe due diligence period in there. Yeah, that's good. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Now I, you got a good, it, it seems like obviously you're, you're doing something right. If you got 180 deals a year or 200, uh, what, what have you learned that you can give advice on running like a sales organization? You're, you know, running three different acquisition reps and lead managers. Do you have any takeaways that you would um, yeah. like to share? Um, everybody's full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> except for you, right? <laughs> Everybody, except for me and you and the two of you. But uh, every, especially salespeople. Yeah. Uh, and so what I mean by that is just accountability is so important. 
right? And so with the lead managers, so people are answering the phones or making outbound dials, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have you know, empirical data that we you know, measure with our phone system. They can't tell me how many outbound dials they made. The dashboard told me, right? They can't tell me how many appointments they booked. We've got it, it's all logs, it's all connected in the CRM. So just empirical data for the sake of accountability, I think is very important. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. And then I would say the same thing with the uh, acquisition reps. This, this is why I think the daily huddle is so important with them because they're like the, they're like the, the biggest, um, it's like herding cats, right? They're the most individually minded of all of our, my employees. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's that daily accountability is, is important. Um, and you got to hold their feet to the fire with regards to commitments, with regards to, uh, I, I had one, I'll, I'll tell you another story. There's a quick one. Um, I don't know, acquisitionist, um, obviously not going to give his name, but he's a great, great. I think he's a truly good person. Mm-hmm. Um, he was with me three and a half months and he brought in 93 contracts. Wow. Mm. Right. That's a lot of sticking contracts. Yeah. yeah. Three and a half months. And I made a lot of money off of him. And then uh, there was a significant uh, HR issue with him. I had to let him go uh, instantly, which left me with a whole big crap storm. And so we started calling all these sellers that he had contracts with. And, you know, he might have signed up like 95% LTV, he told him he would close cash in two weeks, right? He was just saying whatever had to be said wow. to get the deal done, to get a contract. And that's just not who we are. That's not sustainable. Right. Uh, and so when, when somebody's scripting goes off, because, you know, now there's multiple people talking to the seller after the acquisitions does, mm-hmm. we got to do, adjust your, like, what are you saying? No. And like, I'll call the seller. Hey, I'm sitting here with Eric and hey, I'm really sorry you were told this. He's new. Don't worry. You know, here's what we can actually do. You want to continue to want to terminate. And if you give a seller an opportunity to terminate because the acquisition has made a wrong promise, like they straighten up their act real quick. Mm-hmm. Wow. wow. So yeah. do, are you having your lead managers follow up on every call now? Or you that, mean uh, after a, a, After every appointment or contract? Yeah. Uh, we have a whole process uh, yeah. for doing that. I think I actually shared that at CG a few yeah. months ago for like depending on the stage of lead, what our follow-up looks like. But yeah, we have a, I would say, I should know this exact number. It's, it's around half of our appointments booked are from previously run appointments that at least six months old. We don't rebook if it's more recent than six months and we want to get the contracts that way. Sweet. Are you, uh, are you, are you, do you believe in, I know this was like a debate, but do you believe in phone trying to close over the phone versus appointments in person? Do you have a preference? I keep going back and forth, man. So yeah. it's like, here's the, here's the challenge. You can do so many more appointments over the phone mm-hmm. and you don't need to pre-screen because there's very little vested effort but your closing rate is going to be better in person. All that matters is what's the ROI of marketing dollars. Mm-hmm. All that matters. So you got to kind of do the math to, to break that down. Uh, we do both to answer your question. Okay. We used to do only in person. Then when the pandemic hit, we did only phone. And now it's um, all of our initial appointments are on the phone. But I tell my acquisition, I say, listen, they, they each have two half day slots a week for just for in-person meetings. So they talk to somebody on Monday. Hey, listen, how about we meet tomorrow around three o'clock in the afternoon? And let's, uh, you know, I can take a look at the house, sharpen my pencil on the number, and we can go over the paperwork then and get that clock started, and we can go ahead and do the paperwork tomorrow. Because a lot of people just aren't comfortable with DocuSign. Since we implemented that, we have seemed to, uh, we get about two-thirds of our contracts signed in person, but usually started with the phone appointment. That's fine. That's wow. Cool. That's pretty cool. So tell us a little bit about your current goals and maybe some of your, your five-year goals. Sure. Sure. Uh, people ask me this and I always kind of struggle. I, had, I don't know how long it's going to take. I, might, I, I saw this question ahead of time. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is going to be, but I'll, I'll just say that. Um, so I, I think that we can get to doing our, around 200 houses a year profitably. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we can do that probably within a year. Um, I think within five years, maybe three, we'll be at 200, uh, 200 rentals. Mm-hmm. And I think this will be more like a two or three year goal. We'll see, but uh, 100,000 square feet of self storage um, uh, under ownership. Uh, that's that's my goal. I don't know if that's like three years or five years. Those are my goals. Um, by the time I'm 50, my goal is to have $100,000 a month in uh, net residual income from rental, storage, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think those goals are in line with that. Are you uh, a big, are, are, have you been uh, divesting into self storage? Self storage. I bought my first one on New Year's Eve. Awesome. Uh, Sweet. It's a small facility. We're, we're expanding it. Um, How's that going? It's good. It's uh, yeah. 100% full. It's awesome. Sweet. Uh, I've learned that a land development plan, even on a small site, is $40,000. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. 
Everything's a lot more than you think. You're like, ah, oh, that's like $5,000. Yeah. Know, it's, not that. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a supersized survey, right? right? It's like, what? Yeah, five grand. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> These engineers, like, well, why are they getting paid so much? Right. But, uh, <laughs> and then congratulations on the new home. I, I hear, uh, yeah, a, a, a family estate, right? Is that? Yeah. No, we're excited. It's uh, just under uh, 6,000 square feet above grade. Awesome. And then uh, it's on six and a half acres. And then uh, we bought. There's one parcel that touches it, and then there's a third parcel that touches it. We're we're buying as well, uh, all from the same seller. Crazy divorce people; they don't talk to each other. Uh, he's an absolute jerk. They each have an attorney. There are two listing agents involved, and there's a brother-in-law. And it was the world's most complicated negotiation. I I've bet. Ever but the, whenever there's that kind of complications, it there's opportunity, right? Yeah, for sure. So, 100%. Yeah. 100%. Well, that's sweet. So Jim, I have a qu question for you. So I know you do a great job of balancing, you know, home life and business life. How do you do it? <laughs> How do I do it? <laughs> so um, one is like, you know, Marina, my wife helps kind of keep me straight, right? Mm -hmm. But um, when, before we got married, I always use this analogy, before we got married, I was working like 60 hours a week and my wife would work like 50. And we did like 30 houses. Right. Mm -hmm. And we decided before we got married, listen, you know, because you know, my wife had her son from a previous marriage. And so we wanted to have a family life from day one, not just a, a work couple. Um, and so we said, let's have these, let's have these bookends that we like virtually with no exceptions. We ever violate them. And that is we have breakfast together as a family. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't get up and, you know, do my Peloton and then run out the door. I get up, do my Peloton, take a shower. I have breakfast with the family. We make breakfast in the kitchen. It's relaxed, like 45 to 60 minute ordeal. Then I take my steps out of school and then we go, then I go off to, to work. Um, so we, we set these boundaries and refuse to uh, violate them with almost no exceptions. And that alone, just like all of a sudden, if you force yourself to do it, I found it, um, you figure it out. That's, that's like the, it's like, it sounds too simple, but uh, that, that's part of it. But uh, that's yeah. sweet. I mean, usually the simplest things that people take for granted are usually. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. So Very cool. Well, Thanks for sharing that. What a, uh, I'm just curious if I know you did a lot of education back in the day and you, you taught and you built one of the largest RIAs there in Philadelphia. So if you were just starting out today, can you give some advice on, on uh, how you get started and, and what to look for? Or? Yeah, I think that I would say two things, um, three things, I'll do three. Uh, one is, and this is just like a, a, a way you've got to approach life, I think as an entrepreneur, and this is part of what. Uh, like led to my early failure mm -hmm. and I was just afraid to face my fears, right? What were some of my fears? Um, firing a contractor, raising private capital, going through the mental, emotional anguish of evicting tenants. <laughs> so you just got to face those fears regardless. Like my biggest fear today that I face in my company, not at the moment, but in general is firing employees. I hate it. Like I mm -hmm. love everybody that works here, but when the time comes, you've got to do, you know, mission first, team first, you know, person, team member right. last, Right. And um, so it's like, you got to face your fears. I think is the most important thing. Uh, next is you've just got to always be, be learning. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of people get stuck in that. Mm -hmm. So where do you learn? You learn from local people who are doing the business. Podcasts like this, Bigger Pockets is a great resource. Uh, there are plenty of good seminars out there. So you got to get some education. But you know, most important, I was, actually, it's more important than education. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I always ask people when they say, I've been getting into real estate, um, and they tell me if they're either struggling or doing well, I always ask one question. How many sellers are you talking to a day or how many offers are you making a day? And if their answer is, oh, I'm networking or um, <laughs> you know, I'm going to a seminar, yeah. like, dude, stop deluding yourself. Well, that, that's so offer. true, though, because we just talked about that in our last podcast where, I mean, you know, there's so many of us just – the get soaked up on the education piece and they don't ever do anything with it, right? Or they're setting up their LLC and you know? it's like, they haven't even bought a house. You know? just, just. Get out there and make yeah. something happen. Create yeah. the problem. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. So that's it. Like if, you, if you're like, get, if you've already started to get started in this business and you think you're getting started, ask yourself every day, how many people did I talk to about selling their house? And that answer is like one, like get off your ass and get to work. Yeah, awesome. totally. What about uh, any good books you can recommend or the, your favorite book or one you're reading now? Yeah, I think that uh, the book that I was thinking about this, um, the, the book that I think is one of the most insightful for me. I used to listen to a lot of Brian Tracy and read a lot of, read a lot of his books. Uh, he wrote two books that I just found very helpful uh, early on. One was the book is called Goals. That's it, Goals by Brian Tracy. Okay. Another one was uh, Maximum Achievement. I would 
if you had to pick one, I picked the second one. Maximum Achievement by Brian Tracy. He talks about the psychology of it and uh, kind of the success mindset. And uh, I absolutely loved it. It's that's awesome. Great. Yeah, all right. Very good. You got any other questions? No, I there, think or? that's it. Well, uh, Jim, we appreciate you being on today. Any last minute words there? Yeah, or how can they get involved with you? Or, I don't you know. I know you're not doing the, uh, I just found out today, you're not doing the education piece <laughs> anymore, but uh, I thought you still were involved in that. But I mean, if, if you know, people want to reach out to you or people are local to your market, maybe private lenders, whatever, you know, um, sure. you know, how can they so get in the, touch uh, with you? I'd say the best way to reach out to me is, is on uh, is on Facebook. I've got uh, this email filter that like I see nobody's emails except for like like five people and everything else just goes away. Um, <laughs> so just reach out on Facebook. I'm the only Jim Zaspel on Facebook. It's facebook.com forward slash Jim Zaspel. And uh, send me a message request to reach out. We'll, we'll connect on there. Yeah, you got to check out and his Facebook uh, lives. Keep doing those lives. Facebook lives. I love it. I listen to them all the time. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, no, Sh- here Sean is like anti Facebook. <laughs> No, that's he's cool. on there like twice a year <laughs> no, we, we really appreciate you being on and um, i think that was great and uh you know if we can ever do anything for you please let us know um and we'll see you what in june yes we'll see you in june marina's gonna come this time oh, Yay. Okay. That's yeah. awesome. yeah that should be a good yeah. time so all right thank you both all right thank all you all right take care jim all right bye-bye You've been listening to Inside the Wolf's Den, an entrepreneurial journey with Sean and Joni Wolfswinkle. Tons of entrepreneurial podcasts are out there talking. Cock, cock, cocking. But Joni and Sean are living it every single day. Their portfolio now includes many franchises and medium-sized businesses. We talk about the trials and motivators of successfully running a business. Join us again soon for another podcast. But until then, reach out on the website at InsideTheWolfsDen.com, on Facebook at InsideTheWolfsDen, on Instagram at InsideTheWolfsDen. We'll see you again soon. This is Inside the Wolf's Den. We'll see you next time.